afternoon, everyone. All right. Welcome to the sixth annual, what used to be called the Rise of the Female Founder, but no longer the Rise of. It's just the Female Founders Program because we have risen. So, welcome. So, uh, Meredith Finn from Marsh Capital Partners and I usually co-host this event and Unfortunately, Meredith had a personal emergency, so she's not here today. And I know, and she's been texting me all day, that she is absolutely uh, bummed not to be here because both for her and for me, this is our absolute favorite event of the year uh, to attend. The energy in the room, the amazing people who are here, the women and the men who are in the room. It's just a fabulous event. So thank you all so much for being here. So I, I'm going to kick this off a little bit differently this year because it feels to me every year sort of the world feels a little bit different. And this year, it feels like we're at a very interesting inflection point in history. And how we choose to live our lives, what we choose to do, how we build our companies, the cultures that we inculcate into the companies, how we lead our teams matters more than any other time in history. And I'm going to show you some data to say why, why I believe that. For the first time in human history, we're in a moment where the pace of technology innovation is actually outstripping our ability as human beings to adapt. And that has some pretty meaningful implications for society. So let me show you what I mean. Let's see if we can make this work. All right, so it's a little bit of a history lesson. But I want to talk you through the five technology revolutions that humanity has gone through up through the 20th century. Now, what I mean by technology revolution is these are moments in time when um, hum humanity, humankind, has absolutely been impacted by technology and the way we live has, has changed, and that's had social implications that come with it. And those social implications aren't always great. So starting with the agricultural revolution, or some people call it the British agricultural revolution, which took place in the 17th and, and 18th century, there were new farming methods, new breeding methods that, that came to play with the use of technology. And with those new farming and breeding methods, um, food production went through the roof. As a result, populations got very healthy. And in Europe, populations actually doubled in size. Now, what happened with that was the agricultural share of labor went down, and we started the urbanization movement, the movement from farms to cities. Now, the agricultural revolution took 200 years, to, and, and society had time to adapt. By the way, the big tech revolution before that was Gutenberg's invention of the printing press around 1440. It also took about 200 years for the printing press to take hold and to change society. So if we go back far enough, we had centuries to adapt as technology came in and life changed. So the agricultural revolution paved the way for the first industrial revolution, where we had new manufacturing processes that came into play, and the steam engine and the cotton gin were uh, sort of two big uh, inventions that, that changed things. And that lent, led to mechanization, and again, the start and the movement of urbanization, which paved the way, and that took about 100 years, so now it's getting shorter, um, took, uh, gave way to the technology revolution, which started around 1870. Now, with the technology revolution, we had new technology that sped up the pace of how things happen. So we had gas engines and airplanes. We had chemical fertilizers. We had technology that changed the way we lived our lives. We had the telephone that came into play, light bulb, radio. Um, what also came with that, the social change that came with that, is moving life into a factory life. Low wages, terrible working conditions, terrible living conditions, lots of social change. That took about. 70 years. You can see it keeps getting cut in half. From the technology revolution, or some people call that the second industrial revolution, we moved to the scientific revolution. And what happened there was mainframes and computing, massive disruption of how different industries 
uh, functioned. During that time, we also came into the nuclear age. A lot of Einstein's inventions led to some outcomes that had some real implications for humanity. And that paved the way for the IT revolution, right? The internet age. Now, the internet age, or tech utopianism, started as this amazing movement, right? It was completely utopian in, in concept. It was um, universal connectivity, universal interoperability. It was the dem democratization of communication, right? You communicate with anyone you wanted at any time. It was the democratization of information, complete access to information. Trillions of dollars of economic value were created during the IT revolution. And we have uh, information wars. We have influence campaigns. We have fake news. We have polarization of society driven by technology. The IT revolution is about 20 years till we get to the current age. And what we're seeing today is not one technology revolution, not two technology revolutions, but three technology revolutions happening simultaneously. You have the gen genetic revolution. Can you afford to create the perfect baby for yourself? You have the AI revolution. There's an Oxford study that says AI is going to cause 47% of jobs to disappear within the next 25 years. And you have the energy revolution, which hopefully will lead to the complete destruction of the petroleum economy, but certainly as a result is going to have some massive implications for a lot of different industries. If you look at this, um, there are three key takeaways that I've put up there. These technology revolutions are happening at an increasingly rapid pace, and they are actually at stripping our ability to adapt. Meanwhile, we have income inequality that's been created as a result of all these tech revolutions. And income inequality in the US is worse than any other country in the world. And so much change in such a short period of time, so much technology innovation, requires, it requires stunning leadership. So there's no better way to demonstrate why it requires stunning leadership than to look at how the IT revolution has impacted our society. Um, yesterday, I did a panel, and I quoted E.O. Wilson, who's a Harvard University sociobiologist. And he has this quote that I'm just going to keep saying, because I think it's the best quote in the world for today's time. But he said it 10 years ago. He said, the problem with humanity is that we have Paleolithic brains, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. And um, he said it 10 years ago, but it is absolutely prescient. And if we look at how this godlike technology, how all of this IT has impacted our society, we'll see um, that it's not always great. So we know we live in a polarized society. What our technology platforms have done over the past 10 years, the way they curate news for us, the way they um, help us adapt to the technology, it has forced us to a place where their job is simply to make sure we stay on the platforms as long as possible, and um, uh, they play into our cognitive biases. So human beings are born with about 152 cognitive biases that make us feel really good about how we feel and our worldview, and these tech pl platforms feed into those biases by curating our news based on things that make us feel good about, our, uh, about what we believe. Now, as a result of that, um, and this is, uh, this is a chart that was um, uh, done by Pew, uh, where it leaves us is a society that can barely function. So if you look at 1994, you see that, and this is Democrats and Republicans, the difference between Democrats and Republicans was very little. Everybody wanted the same end. We all had common goals for society. We might disagree over how to get there and what the means might be, but we wanted the same thing and there was a middle. 2004, we actually got closer. Democrats and Republicans started overlapping even more than that. Now, I think 9-11 had something to do with that. But whatever the case was, we still had a democracy that was trying to get to the same place. Now, 2004 was also the year that Facebook was invented. Now, you look at what happens in 2017, and by the way, if this, you play this out to 2020, the chart actually looks even worse. By 2017, the middle is gone. There is no common ground. There is no consensus. What we have is a tribal society. In tribalism, it's not about having a polite disagreement with your neighbor. It's about not wanting to live next door to someone 
who doesn't agree with your worldview. In a tribal society, it is really hard to get things done. Government can't function, right? We have enact Obamacare, repeal Obamacare, Brexit, snap vote. We simply jump between polar opposites. And we're going to have to find this common ground. And what technology is doing today is simply pushing us further apart. Now, this may all be OK if we weren't starting at a particularly fragile point in sort of human history. It may not feel this way in this room, but the truth is that for most Americans, for the past 15 years, they have seen their incomes decline. So for the past 15 years, 90 million households, that's 227 million people, have seen declining income. That's why they don't feel that the world feels particularly good. And by the way, it's not just in the US. When you look at the G7 and G20 countries, mo over half the people believe that they are worse off today than they were 20 years ago. Now, um, it's not all that bad, right? So I'm painting a pretty tough picture. But the truth is, you guys are building companies. You guys are embracing technology to disrupt the world, to change the world. You are building businesses, and you have a choice to make about how you build those businesses. And it matters more today than it ever has in humanity. So I am, and this is part of what I love about this room and what I love especially about female founders. Um, we, I mean, men do as well, but we really care about the world that we leave, live, leave behind. And so the cultures you build, the communities you build, there is no more important time in human history than today. The world is moving fast. Technology innovation is happening at a pace we are not used to seeing, and we absolutely need stunning leadership to make it happen. And that's where you guys come in, because every single human being in this room has a choice to make about how they're going to live their lives and what kind of company they're going to build. So now this is where I would hand it over to Meredith. And Meredith would um, come in and tell me that I just did a great job, <laughs> and then um, start introducing all the companies that are here and all the amazing entrepreneurs that you guys are going to hear from. So the goal today is really just to uh, listen to some amazing people about how they're building their companies and how they see the world and learn from them. Hopefully throughout the Montgomery Conference, you have seen some amazing women who are building meaningful and powerful companies. Aloe View by Jessica Gardner, which is helping create better outcomes for students for every dollar spent on K through 12 education. All Voices, led by Claire Schmidt, which enables companies to build better and more inclusive cultures through transparent incident reporting. Alpha, led by Gloria Lau, which is providing affordable and convenient access to critical health care. Plum, led by Caitlin McGregor, helping enterprises build and hire, manage employees in more and have more diverse workplaces. Now that was from the main conference. Today you're going to continue, we're going to continue to showcase some incredible entrepreneurs, some meaningful companies, and the founders who are building them. We have Joanna from Hopskip Drive, which has created a ride-sharing solution for kids to support working parents and enable safe transportation. We have Sheila from Thrilling, which is providing ways to better showcase and sell used clothing and reduce waste and environmental impact of fashion. We have Katie from Carbon 38 that's created a marketplace for athletic gear to help us look great while we're staying fit, but also help support emerging designers and give them a platform to grow their businesses. There's Jess from Indonero, which is providing much needed financial transparency to small and medium businesses, helping to drive economic growth and job creation. Shivani from Tala, whose micro-lending platform is enabling financial control and access to over 3 billion underserved people. And of course, there's Pune from Tokidoki, which is one of my favorite brands out there, and you're going to hear from her soon as well. Now, we'll kick it off by starting with a great group of investors to help give us some perspective on how this world works. So with that, um, I want you to really listen and pay attention to all the amazing women who are going to come here and talk about how to build amazing companies. Thank you.